Welcome back to Cocktails and Classics. Hi. This week, we're keeping the comedy streak rolling and watching a lighthearted family <laughs> film, A Clockwork Orange. Uh, uh, no. uh, oh, it is not that at all. Uh, we're watching Stanley Kubrick's 1971 uh, crime sci-fi dystopian drama film. It's hard to place exactly uh, what genre this falls into. I guess it's kind of a drama, but like that's the that's the best bucket I could put it into, I guess. And it's apparently a dystopian film. Yeah, that makes sense. It yeah, kind of feels like that. Like I don't know. I thought it was like I I don't know. I guess I associate dystopia with future. I mean, it's kind so, of futuristic based on when it was from. From when it was written, it's supposed to take place in a not so distant, yeah, Britain, Great Britain. Because I mean, yeah. the movie was made in like so it's like nineteen late sixties, early seventies, I think, right? And uh, I think... the movie was made in seventy one. Seventy one. Okay, so uh, it might have been. And I made... think the book came out the in the book 60s? came out in sixty two. Yeah. Okay. I think it was supposed to be like the the book probably was supposed to take place when the movie came out and the movie is supposed to take place like probably in the 80s or 90s although it's still a very early 70s aesthetic in the movie with some weird shit oh, mixed yeah. in hard hard on like the austin powers yeah mm -hmm. i got some serious <laughs> austin <laughs> powers vibes from the movie especially with like you know See, i don't know they had like naked women like everywhere alex's house yeah like, Just to preview uh, the reviews, Cameron's review of this podcast is groovy, baby. Oh, my God. <laughs> so Alex's parents, though, his mom and dad, their wardrobes looked like they stepped straight off the set of a Tim Burton movie. Yeah. Yeah. In a, I wouldn't call it pivotal scene, but Alex, for a cocktail, we're not really drinking a cocktail. We're drinking some red wine this week. But in a pivotal scene, um, a character comes back. And says, "Try the wine." <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, oh, you like it? Have some more. <laughs> <laughs> and Thanks, has Alex try a here. a Chateau Beausite hot? <laughs> no play. Yes. I'm sorry, I fucking butchered that. <laughs> it's the Chateau. But, I just don't know what else. It is a there. yeah. It's a Saint Estefi. Uh, basically, it's, it's a red brand. blend of uh, Cabernet Savion, Merlot, and uh, Petit Verdo. This dude just butchered half of what he fucking said and then tries to sound fancy as fuck. It's a Petit <laughs> Verdo. Verdo. <laughs> like, Pet fuck out of here. Petit it's Verdo. like when you go to the local mes Mexican restaurant and you say gracias <laughs> when they bring your food. <laughs> I would energy. like uno taco. Thank you. No I would taco, like some, favor. some agua, por favor. <laughs> Gracias. Sounded like Brad Pitt and Inglorious Bastards. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> all right, so I butchered all of that. Uh, if you want to drink the actual wine, I'll leave a link down below. Do you have a link? How much is it? Is it, is it stupid expensive? Yeah. Um, I figure it's old at this point. It's super old. I couldn't find the exact one, but some people had like updated versions. Especially if you want to get the right year. Yeah, but it's <laughs> yeah, 50 oh, years God, old. It's right all years. about the vintage. It was then. It's all about the vintage. I think that the year was like in the 60s or something. So it wasn't even that old. Yeah, it was a 1960 Chateau. So I'm drinking a uh, Menage a Trois red blend. And Appropriate for the it movie. It didn't have the Petit Verdot, but it had the uh, Cabernet Savion and the Merlot. So I was like, that's close enough. And that's like 10 bucks. So I'm sipping on that. <laughs> yeah, mine was just a homemade red blend from a family member. So... Some we toilet wine. Quite a few bottles of it, and uh, so I just cracked that bottle for myself. Have a fun time. I used to hate wine, but now I feel like as I grow older, I'm like, you know, what? it's it's not bad. It's a little sweet for my taste. This one, I, I like drier things when it comes to like wine and ciders. So I I'm not gonna lie. I don't hate it. I'm not a big wine person, and typically when I drink wine, it is on the sweeter side. But this stuff is, it's sweet. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. Maybe it's all the liquor I've been drinking over the past eight months since we started doing this. Um, that I've grown to in, like drink more and more liquor. And I'm like, oh, maybe wine's just good without being 
hella sweet. Ben's like, bring back bourbon and maple syrup. Yeah. We yeah. haven't done that in a minute. Bring back the bourbon, coffee, and maple syrup. You act like I don't make those whenever there's leftover coffee in my house. <laughs> Cam, did you try the wine? <laughs> no, I don't think... I. I wouldn't even know where to begin with buying a wine, and I would only it's drink, It's really like, easy. You look for the bottle that says Red Blend, and you grab it. <laughs> what I mean is I don't know if I could find one that I would actually enjoy. I've never tried a red wine that I actually like, and I would probably only drink, like, half a glass before pitching the whole bottle. So, so our plans, depending on, like, how the whole COVID situation goes, is we wanted to, maybe in February, get together, which is the big stretch, and then <laughs> possibly do like wine and cheese with a movie, maybe a Groundhog's Day or something. We'll see how fast Pfizer can get some vaccines off the shelf. But maybe, um, maybe a classic little rom com. Yeah, a little wine just, and cheese, and we'll—that's what we'll do. We'll do wine tastings. We'll try to find. We'll sample so many wines. We'll find one Cameron likes. We'll buy like a dozen bottles of wine. It'll probably be the last one, but. You know, <laughs> I bet you his ratings get better as we get through more samples. <laughs> I did do a wine tasting recently, and it was, I think, it was a bunch of sweet wines. There were some rosés in there and some whites, and those were pretty good. I mean, again, this isn't something I would, like, just, like, you know, go out of my way to drink. But if it's offered, you know, that one's, that's not too bad. If you try some some red wine, hopefully you have. <laughs> if you try some red uh, wine. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have specifics here. Maybe you try to find the chateau. You need the fifteen uh, second pause. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna fuck yeah. it up anyways. Keep keep that in. Don't cut that. I want people to hear. You just go to say chateau and then dead air for fifteen seconds. Dead I'm air. just gonna find like a pronunciation uh, on YouTube, and I'm just gonna throw that robot just, voice in there. Yeah, just drop Google Translate. It's just <laughs> shitty. It's like it's like Microsoft Sam. Chateau Saint Stephen Duc. Chateau <laughs> to Beau. Like, also, maybe uh, maybe to the listeners, we're not really big wine fanatics, but some of us are trying to get into it. If you have a red wine, you would recommend. Drop it in the chat. Drop it in the comment section. Let's or find white. or write to we us. Not, we accept yeah, letters. We, no, no, no. I said white, not right. But... Oh, sorry. I thought you said right, as in, like, send us letters. No, I said white, as in not red wine. <laughs> we don't discriminate we will find with a... wines. We like the goal wine. to the listeners. Find a red wine Cameron would like. Good luck. I like sweet stuff. We'll make stuff. him try every bottle. His, his address is sweet. He follows. does like ciders. Please address the bottles of wine to Cameron <laughs> at... Uh, <laughs> insert Zach's address. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I was literally going to start rattling off. P.O. Box. <laughs> so send us a picture of you enjoying your red wine on Instagram mm-hmm. at Cocktails and Classics Pod. <laughs> Use the hashtag Cocktails and Classics. Uh, we'd love to see you enjoying the podcast and your red wine. Yeah, so when you listen if- to the podcast, take a picture like a sociopath and send it to us <laughs> with yeah, some red exactly. wine, you know? Send a picture of where you're at right now listening to this podcast. Cause we also, want to send a it. picture of your Are social you your... security number and your address <laughs> and your mother's maiden name and your bank account information. Yeah, I really need a credit card. The price of Xboxes has gone up drastically. <laughs> yeah, it costs like two grand for those sons of bitches on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, love to, we'd love to hear what you think of, of the Chateau Pinot Why? Noir. So... <laughs> If you have not seen A Clockwork Orange, uh, pause here. Go watch it. It's available on Netflix right now. If you're listening later, I'm sorry. It might not be available. Go rent it. Probably not. But uh, we are about to spoil the shit out of the movie and discuss it. So sip on some red wine and enjoy. A Clockwork Orange is a 1971 crime drama sci-fi from Stanley Kubrick. It currently sits at an 8.3 out of 10 on IMDb. It's number 103 on the imdb top 250 the screenplay was written by stanley kubrick the novel was written by anthony burgess directed by stanley kubrick it stars malcolm mcdowell patrick mcgee michael bates it was nominated for four oscars best picture best director best writing based on material from another medium and best film editing and as we've joked about it uh being super lighthearted comedy uh cam what did you think of this fucking depressing film a weird movie um i get the themes like i understand what the intent of the movie is it feels like 
I mean, it's basically a commentary or discussion, I guess, about like the free will of man and whether or not it's good to essentially have restrict the free will of man in order for the uh, maybe betterment of the rest of society in which I think the end of the movie kind of leaves you not sure where they stand on that. It seems like it frames it in a negative light since they play him, the main character, like a victim. However, for me, I this is such a grotesque it's movie. A- it's it's really really hard for me to watch this movie and like think about those things while also viewing these like grotesque scenes where like the violence isn't so bad, but they have these just awful like rape scenes in the movie, and it I got it. I'm not gonna lie, it's like hard to watch those. Like it's physically hard to watch this movie. And to sit down and actually watch it. Because some of the scenes in those regards were, you know, the sex stuff. And that's not even a fair way to call it. But that stuff is taking place. So, I just want to interject and ask. Did you have any idea that was coming no, with this movie zero. at all? So, okay. I was curious if you had any inclination about what was going going to happen in this movie. Uh, because when we suggested this last week, and I, I told Dylan this before we started recording. This movie feels like a movie like you weirdly enough like you have to be in a certain mood to watch it and i feel like i'm never in that mood yeah yeah it's you just have so to be dark. in the mood to discuss it on a podcast like you have to like <laughs> this movie seems like such kind of an edgelord movie yeah and i'm just never in that headspace to be like i'm gonna really enjoy this yeah and it's just so weird to me because i feel like i don't know i get people that it, i get why people like the movie and i get the commentary around it I just don't, I don't know, like something about it is just weird. Like you said, it is an edgelord movie and it almost glorifies the dude's behavior in the movie because he starts off obviously a jerk who is going around fighting people, raping people, killing people. And then he ends the movie as the same exact person, except the only difference is the government's basically bribing him to be silent in their actions too. And so the end of the movie doesn't really feel like have you feeling good about anything, really. Which the government is like also just super weirdly shady as fuck. Yeah. Like once you find out that Georgie and Dim are hired as cops, but then like they're the the guy who takes Alex in is literally like, yeah, and them hiring all those goons as police officers. And you're like, so wait, people are fully aware. aware that this is happening. Yeah. Okay got it so it's not just like an error of like oh we didn't really do much of a background check we no, didn't really vet them that well intentionally <laughs> we're just intentionally hiring shitty people yeah this movie for me goes in the same group as like requiem for a dream and one flew over the cuckoo's nest like they're not light-hearted movies at all uh you watch them and you're gonna be sad after yeah but at least one flew over the cuckoo's nest has some levity to it like there's a lot of like l- comedy aspects in that movie and in here there are like none it's also just super weird like the it's like the movie itself is weird like they the opening scene they just start by like drinking milk in this bar where they're like also doing drugs and stuff and you're just like what no the milk has the drugs in it yeah sure but still it's still weird it's fight it's fight milk they have fight milk (laughs) (laughs) Um, by no, bodyguards for bodyguards <laughs> the thing that drives me the most nuts about this movie and it's also kind of in the book too is like the slang terms that they use yeah yeah and you really have to context clues it together uh i mean some of it's pretty obvious but then there's some things that they say that you're just like what wait what the fuck is he talking about? Being perfectly I honest. I do not understand where he's and coming And the author, from. like, made up this language com- combined with, like, Russian and, like, some other language, yeah. I think. Yeah, he combined a couple different languages in that, and it's it's really just fucking random. Yeah, yeah I had to watch this movie with the subtitles on because yeah. it was, like, super thick British accents plus yeah. this made-up shit. Like, I don't have a clue what these guys are saying droogs you know it sounds like dregs but like you know if you said it very yeah. poorly so i believe droogs is obviously like friends i think yeah, i thought it was well, like gang. i thought it was like i thugs. thought it meant like dregs like the like the dregs of society like the thugs the, the thugs the bad no because he bad uses people. it he uses it not only with his buddies but he uses it with other people as well 
I, I guess he... that's true. Yeah, he uh, does say it in the hospital when he's it's almost surrounded like a comrade, by the other people. Sort of. Yeah. Um, comrade. Horror show is like good, I think. That yeah, I didn't like, really understand that one. <laughs> Yarbles, I believe, is uh <laughs> nuts. <laughs> Yarbles. Yar. I don't uh, know. There's some weird ones. There was another one. You say Yarbles and, and nuts, and it reminds me of this. Can we talk about the creepy fucking lawyer or counselor or whatever yeah, the fuck that dude oh, was? Yeah, how was yes, the Tackles nut him on the bed? Dude, that thing? was fucking rapey as hell. Okay, yeah. Also, for context, this dude, the main character is supposed to be in high school, I think, by the way. Yeah. yeah. If that adds any context clues. So this dude is definitely like being sketchy as fuck dude it real I, kevin spacey scene, vibes that scene started and i was immediately just like cringing and i'm like oh well, my and he god grabs how long his is crotch this? later and then he's like scene. sitting with his arm around him and i'm like how fucking creepy how far is this gonna go because it's it's been a while since i've seen this movie and i i don't remember how far this goes so there was a reason um he went back and explained why the character had to lay on the bed um, he was trying to tuck his shirt in after getting a <laughs> microphone out. I read that somewhere. I read that somewhere. Oh, no. <laughs> Him and Rudy have a lot to talk about. <laughs> oh, he also oh, asked for the God. main character's address and phone number. <laughs> they are both lawyers. But he was just tucking his shirt in. No impropriety here. Yeah, I don't know if he, like, grabs his junk or if he just, like, hits him. Slaps he it. He grabs like it, for nice. sure. I thought it was, I like, a nut like he I thought he had a. I thought it was it, a little knocking at the door. It, it wasn't. It, it was I like thought a, he like. It looked, kind of like, a it looked like a tap, it like but it also it. looked like his hand stayed. It looked like his well, hand stayed they, there I mean, a little. Why long. are they wearing these like weird cup things all the time anyway? And what's up with that? For that reason, if you're doing yeah. some ultra violence, you gotta protect the the kids. Yeah, but it's on the outside. Right, of there's video evidence to confirm. It is a nut tap, not a grab. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that makes it. I feel like Zach. I will Zach uh, watch. Oh, post the timestamp. <laughs> Zach watched frame by frame. I don't think it changes my feeling on it. I did run it back. I will say the character or the actor that plays Alex, I think, did a terrific job with you know the the role and also a lot of those scenes where he was forced to have his eyes open I and hate like eye shit, gonna oh, be I sick or whatever. Shit. Yeah, oh, and touching his eyes nuts. to like put the thing oh in. Oh my I was god! Like, oh god! You know what'll uh, make you feel a little better? The guy when they were filming that was doing the eye droppers was an actual doctor. Good. Oh, that's I, good. I, I kind of figured while I watched it because I'm like, there's no way they're they're going to let someone who's not a medical professional do this. And I mean, also, uh, it's and, Kubrick. He kind of just okay. like flies by the seat. But of at his the pants. same time, like, okay, so you have that dude strapped with his eyelids, like open shut you have to have someone there medically to keep it otherwise his eyes would dry out so fucking fast they would they would have to dry out just from the fact that he's constantly honestly i did think about that when they were prying the eyes, eyes open, open i was like how is he gonna keep his eyes moist and then there's i was like oh there's a guy just eyes dropping drop. eyes i drop <laughs> i drop Gross. what a great that doctor just you know it's his he got his sag card probably <laughs> Only not really, because I don't think he talked at all. So I think that's kind of part of the thing. So the eye thing, I, I feel like was, I'm sure, very method. The other thing was the the scene with Dim and Georgie, I believe, was who it was. And they, they're they the As cops, the... and they're, like, waterboarding yeah. him, like, drowning him. Oh, my God. And I was God. like, how long he are they going to keep water. Oh, I'm, seriously, were they just waiting for the bubbles to stop? What the hell? Like I was, I was impressed. Like, can Malcolm McDowell like hold his breath for that long? <laughs> I wanted, to, I wanted to look up how they shot that scene. Like, was there like just like a base layer of water with some sort of mechanism for him to stick his head through so he yeah, could maybe. keep breathing? Maybe. Because, and it didn't seem like there was a cut in that shot. Like, it looked like it was just a continuous. You shot. know what I was thinking? Maybe there was like a tube. Like, you know, like a PVC tube that, like, that could, uh, like, probably had a bit of water. Yeah, that he would have, like, latched on to. Once he's in yeah. um, Similar to, like, a snorkel or something. Yeah. But, yeah, you're right. That was... I was watching that scene on the edge of my seat, like, oh, my God, they're actually going to kill this man. Like, how how are they doing this scene right now? Yeah. yeah, I'd like to know how Kubrick did it. If it weren't for the fact that IMDb told me he was still acting, I'd have thought for sure. <laughs> he was done. That was his last scene ever. 
They filmed it in a, in a weird order situation. where the waterboarding scene was last, <laughs> and they actually killed him. <laughs> well, just to be safe. That's why. You know, they got to be safe with it. That was like a that was my holy shit moment though. Was I you know I've I've seen this movie like once a long time ago, and like when after he's like getting beat up by the uh, tramp is what I'll call him because that's what he's credited as. Uh, once he's getting beat up by the tramp, and the cops show up, you're like, oh, all right, yeah, nice. He's gonna like something's gonna happen with the cops, but he looks up and it's Dim and Georgie, and you're just like, oh shit, oh no. <laughs> you're like, yeah, look at us, we're Bobbies now. <laughs> We have real adult jobs now. <laughs> oh, well, that okay. brings up an interesting theme in the movie where basically he terrorizes all these people in the first half of the movie, and then after he's cured, he somehow inexplicably gets basically victimized by the people he victimized earlier on, which is really interesting. It's a really interesting take on how to do that. Yeah, it is a lot of like revenge almost like the dude who he goes in in the singing in the rain scene which oh my god like way to ruin that song for everybody <laughs> right. yep i i feel like it almost i feel like this almost kind of claimed that song because obviously you do know like singing in the rain the movie and gene kelly with the light post and stuff but yep. i feel like most people if you were to like mention singing in the rain i think they would probably say this movie for for that scene um which i did hear or see that they didn't like that was all improv they like didn't they were trying to spice up the scene a little bit and that was like the only song that malcolm mcdowell like knew the lyrics to and so he started singing it and then kubrick was like that's fucking great went and bought the rights for like 10 grand (laughs) didn't tell them why And like, <laughs> and then Gene Kelly fucking hates that part of the movie. <laughs> I mean, That's a deal. I, I can understand why. <laughs> I don't blame him. If you could buy Singing in the Rain right now for 10K, you would easily do it, right? Like oh, you well, would scrape okay, together 10K to buy 1970s, the rights to it. No, so what is 10K? Inflation yeah. boy. What's... Oh, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me go back. I got to do some algebra with my previous tri- uh, trivia questions. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that they bring that up as a theme of, like, the revenge. Um, And especially the last person, like, he wanted revenge when he found out, but even so, he still used him for, like, his, quote, political purpose. You know, they were trying to find someone who essentially had been, like, wronged by the government through this, like, cure thing. Uh, I think they were looking for anyone that could give them anything on the government. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But then he realized that it was him. And then that's when he, I don't know. Which I don't know what, I don't know if the plot is like, oh, I I remember him. Oh, that's right. He doesn't recognize me because I was wearing a mask. What's the one thing I did that was, would be super (laughs) fucking memorable. Oh, I know the song I sang while I kicked him consistently and then cut his wife's clothing off. He'll never think it's me if I start singing that song. Yeah. I don't know if the plot to make him try to kill himself came before or after that realization. That's what I'm not sure of. Is they obviously wanted to use him for, you know, exposing the government, right? But I don't know if they wanted to make him kill himself before or after they realized that that's who he was. I I put it as they... I don't know if it was as much they wanted to make him... Well, they did, obviously, once they found out that he was, you know, thinking about it. But they do allude to it earlier when he's walking down before he gets confronted by the tramp. And he's looking at the bridge, and he's looking... I interpreted it as he's looking kind of from the bridge down into the water. That was my feeling, like, he was considering at that point whether or not he should just jump. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm just wondering if those people who, like, drugged him... Like, cause they played that music yeah, intentionally to get him to yeah. try and jump out the jump out yeah. of the window. So I'm wondering if that was their plan all along, or if they kind of improved that after they realized he was the one that you know made the writer disabled. Well, I think I think at the end, the minister, I believe it is, he's he does say like, oh, there was that writer who thinks that you had something to do with the death of his wife or whatever. He was the minister, yep. Mm-hmm. So I, I think of it's... Of someone very close to him or something. Yeah, he doesn't phrase it as his wife. He keeps it kind of vague, but yeah. you obviously know who he's talking about. Yeah, like, I think it's still sort of... 
vague in well, a sense there. Yeah, I mean, the minister in that scene is, like, basically bribing him, saying, like, we took care of the dude who thinks that you killed his wife, or is responsible for the death of his wife, which said he she had m- pneumonia, you know, I don't know, but um, we're going to give you a job with an adequate pay, and basically all you have to do is be a good little boy and put your thumb up and just, like, smile for the cameras. Yeah, I heard you liked music. Here's everyone with cameras. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Got a surprise for you. How nice of a how nice of a job and what's the salary? <laughs> it's adequate. <laughs> Whatever you find adequate. Easy job. It'll be easy and it'll be you'll get paid more than what you should make. Yeah, basically. Um mm. Yeah, it's just hard cuz for me I get the, those themes of the movie and like those discussions but to me it's kind of undercut by some of those like other scenes that are more just like i don't know very in your face grotesque whatever words you want to use like not just the scenes of it but like there's just the reference to sex like in every the fucking time. scene uh, the old what is it with these dystopian authors all of the background, of the of the background pieces sex. all of the background pieces are all like paintings of naked women yeah like everything that exists is like there to take it back to that and at some point it's just like okay do we is this really the choice well, like yeah that we need to make and it, it does every, like in they do the same with scene. men as well yeah because like on, oh, when yeah. in the one pl- at thing where they're hanging out there's the painting and then everybody's like they've mm-hmm. drawn a bunch of dicks on it and stuff like yep. that like it's not even like it's weird it's not even just like naked women though it's like it's like a hustler magazine, basically. Like, yeah, it's naked oh, yeah. women in but they're like, like, no, like spread, poses. yes, bush, yep. like that sort of stuff. And it's yep. just like, like it's Why? like overtly it's weird. sexual in a sense. Brave yeah, New World just... is the exact same way, and it was always weird to me how they always like. There's this always this focus on like sex in these books. And 19, movies where it's 1984 like, is kind of like that too. Like, is it? Yeah. I don't remember that being as um, overt as Brave it has New a couple World, of. But... There's a couple of times that it gets a little overtly sexual and i i can't remember it's been a long time and to be honest i to, to be honest i'm sorry to my professor Cliff who i read this book here. for <laughs> who i read the book for class but i barely read that book for my class <laughs> but i don't remember yeah. there be it being as like hypersexual in that like i feel like a lot of this was no. a, was very much a kubrick decision yeah yeah it's only in a couple scenes when winston really gets a, a hard on for julia and he's like he goes into too much depth. I think Ben is talking about book. Clockwork Ben, are you Orange. talking about the book for this movie? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm talking, talking about a Clockwork Orange. But I mean, uh, 1984 is kind of the same. Yes. 1984 <laughs> is kind of the same way. But I mean, like, in terms of, of the a Clockwork Orange, the book, like, he doesn't talk about there being hustler fucking paintings in every, every house or whatever. Like, I think it was very much a, a Kubrick decision, and at times it just... It was just too fucking much. Like, yeah, or let, like the girls that are the like scene, eating. Let the, the scene penis speak lollipops? for themselves. Yeah, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That was super. Well, I mean, like the the cat lady that he ends yeah, up with killing dick with a giant dick statue. <laughs> like, just kind of let the fucking scene speak for themselves. Like sometimes, sometimes it was just so distracting that it was like, oh, I feel like I can't really focus on what's going on because there's yeah a shit ton of just pornography all over this and i will say this is like a really odd feeling for me i feel like i don't get very like uncomfortable in movies often with like the content with this with you know whatever they show on screen or weirdness in movies but like this one was really off-putting to me i don't know maybe it was a combination of all these things but it was just very very off-putting So this week's podcast is brought to you by Surfside Sips. They make high-impact glass straws. They're a family-owned company. And and what's better than saving saving the turts, you know? The turts? <laughs> the turts? You know, I'm one of those people who hates using paper straws. Paper straws fucking Paper straws suck. suck. They I are love the worst what solution. they do. I love the, that we're, we're minimizing the use of plastic straws. I enjoy that. Paper straws suck ass. They suck. They're the worst possible solution because turns out, guess what? 
paper and water don't fucking mix okay i don't know who came up with it but it doesn't work even though even though they put coating on it to try and help it doesn't work it just gets soggy and you end up throwing it away anyway and that's just more waste and so but you know what doesn't get soggy glass yeah glass straws from surfside sips and if you want to get some glass straws from surfside sips you can use coupon code cocktails and classics spelled out that's cocktails a n d classics for 20 percent off your order and if you're looking for a business to support during this time seems like a good idea today's episode is brought to you by audible audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs news business and self-development but essentially what it is is every month you get one credit to pick any title plus two audible originals from their monthly selection so, Dylan and Zach, what are your experiences with Audible? So, working from home nowadays, I recently used Audible to rip through one of my favorite book series. It's always great to go back and revisit some of your favorites. And since we've recently done From Russia with Love, you could could check out some of Ian Fleming's books on Audible. Uh, they have Dan Stevens, Toby Stevens, uh, Damian Lewis, many great narrators read through Diamonds Are Forever from Russia with Love, Live and Let Die. So maybe you want to get into the James Bond novels as well as the movies. To start your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com slash cocktails and classics, all lowercase. Again, that's audible.com slash cocktails, A-N-D, classics. After your free trial is up, it costs $14.95 per month. However, there are no commitments. And if you can't decide what to listen to, that's okay. You can roll your credits over up to one year. Around here, Zach takes over, puts us through a little trivia quiz. Zach, what do you got for us on A Clockwork Orange? I have a nice, lighthearted, easygoing trivia. It's a musical, really. I don't believe you. It really is a musical of sorts. I mean, the the movie is underscored a lot by the music that it does. Definitely not a musical, but... Anyway, sorry, continue. Uh, For question number one, so so we meet the writer twice. The first time we meet him, his wife gets uh, assaulted by Alex and crew. And then at the end, he comes back and we meet him. He's in a wheelchair. Oh, a wheelchair. And he has this, his, like, helper with him, the super muscular guy. That actor would go on after a clockwork orange to star in what major film series or trilogy i guess i should say the mad max trilogy the jersey trilogy which encompasses like clerks mall rats chasing amy or star wars which actor is this this is the aide for the, the writer hunky, yeah, the dude the, who the super built drags guy the, the writer end. down on like in his wheelchair oh okay no idea who he would be in Star Wars. It'd be hilarious if that was the right answer, though. Wait, which Star Wars uh, are we talking? The originals, uh, probably. The like original 77 trilogy. to 84 or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. Okay. I mean, I don't know if it would help, but but I could say some stuff to maybe help sway us. Just but saying. I don't know if I want to give you guys the aid. Yeah, I think if Dylan gets a win here, he's tied for the most wins in Season 2. I think it would give me the most wins. I think I'm currently tied with Ben. We'll do the math later. We'll get it added to All the right. dashboard. Um, I'm going to say Star Wars. And I can give my reasoning after. Oh, okay. What was the guy's name again? What was his name? Uh, he doesn't have a name. What? What's his real name? Like... He's not going to give you the actor's name. For fuck's sake, that's a giveaway. (laughs) We fucking knew that. What that? That's for fuck's sake, bud. Get off your fucking IMDb. I'm not on IMDb. I was just curious if I would recognize. I didn't. I wasn't sure if he gave uh, it as part of the description. Kevin Smith. Okay, thank you. Kevin Smith is in Clerks, so (laughs) Clerks final answer. Um, no, I don't know. I I'm pretty not sure on this one. Dylan seems to have a reason why he said Star Wars. I want to believe it's Star Wars, but I, I don't know. I'm going to go with Star Wars as well, just because if I don't say Star Wars and the answer is Star Wars, I'm going to feel like a fool. So I'm going to say that. All right, Ben, what you got? Oh, man. 
Uh, this is tricky because I I don't want to just go with the group, but my I'm trying to remember the of the movies of what well, I know of Kevin Smith's movies. I I don't recognize him from the Jersey trilogy. I haven't seen Mad Max, so I can't guarantee if it's him or not. But I do think it's Star Wars. I think he's um I think he's one of the characters that you don't actually see their face, either Chewie or like Vader. Um, so I was gonna say I I do I'm with Ben. He may be Chewy, but because um, he's a no, big, I mean, he's a paid, big played fucking by Peter dude. Mayhew. Yeah, I don't think it's Chewy, but I do think it might be the actor who is the body actor for Darth Vader, but is not the voice because I believe he was cast as Darth Vader and then never told that he was not going to be the voice until like after the movie came out. So I ding, think ding, that's ding. who it is. The correct wow. answer is David Prose. He did play David the body Prose. actor yep. for Darth Vader. Yeah. So that was that his? I, yeah. Well, was that his face my, at and at the end at three or no? Was that a different person? No, or at, at uh, six, it doesn't I look like him. Okay. No, I don't believe it was. I believe once again they cast someone else to be Darth Vader. He really got kind of fucked by George Lucas in that deal. He, he got, just got used for his body. Actually, I I will say think I remember seeing the picture of him in a cast photo. His face looked really familiar from one of the old like pictures of the entire Star Wars cast. Wow. My reasoning was just Star Wars was shot in the UK. The US was Jersey and then Mad Max is Australian. So I'm just kind of like, hmm, probably well, I don't know. Aren't the three main was actors the American? Three in the UK? I don't know if that's true cuz George Lucas is American, Mark Hamill's American. I mean, I guess they could have filmed it there, but the I know the the newer ones are all shot in the UK, but well, I don't, I don't know, know if the old ones are. I the tattooing scenes are hashtag tax relief God, where are they filmed the tattooing ones you can actually go to well those are actually sites. like out in the desert yeah. and like right fucking middle of nowhere but. yeah yeah i think just also the 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 jersey trilogy is just way too late for him to be a a main i don't remember there being anyone who would have been that age to start in the jersey trilogy but we'll get there we'll get there when we do when we do our our jersey movies Oh yeah, no. This says they started Star Wars in Van Van Noys, Vinoy, California. Yeah, that makes sense. Speaking of getting there, we have a three-way tie with one point. Also, uh, speaking of Euro- speaking of European things, uh, the costumes that Alex and his crew wear are based on a uniform from which sport? Is it A. Polo, B. Cricket, or C. Fencing? Oh god, they kind of look like fencing. All outfits. dominated by Europeans. The all white? Are you talking about the all white uniforms? Yeah, you with mean the, uh, you the mean gigantic cock block. Sports dominated by Europeans. I'm gonna go with what are sports Americans don't really care about anyways. We're the world champions at American football. USA, USA, <laughs> USA, USA. I'm gonna say fencing. Fencing I feels think... like such an easy answer. Like it's like it's white. They're white <laughs> uniforms. Everybody knows what fencing uniforms look like. That feels like a that feels like a bait answer. You're right. Cameron talked. Cameron talked me into it. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say fencing uh, because they're all white and it it seems like it's the go to and it, it makes total sense because it looks like a fencing uniform. He totally talked me into it. I was not on board with fencing. Thanks, Cameron. You're welcome. Who wants to get poked in the in the dick with? Yeah, a fencing? you need a nice hard plastic plate right. for that. Uh, I'm gonna go fences? against the grain recognizing that it very well could be fencing because it i'm gonna actually say <laughs> cricket so definitely a sport where you want to protect your goods uh fencing is up there and i can understand why you'd want a hard plastic shell but the answer is cricket nice got him. um wow. a sport where what? you also want to protect your nards because there's um they literally play with stones if you guys have never seen a cricket match they legit play with round stones yeah so a little harder yeah. than a baseball Hurler, the hurler throws it at the, I don't know what the the wicket. The they just sit there and the rochambeau wicket. each other <laughs> repeatedly. That's what cricket is, I think. <laughs> All right, Cameron takes a one point lead. Ha, got him. Dylan and Ben tie with a point each. Question number three: Stanley Kubrick was so afraid that theater owners would edit his movie, so he purposely had all of the film reels replaced every seven. A days. Oh my god. B weeks or C months. Seven months seems like too long of a time, right? 
Kubrick is like the most insane director I think we've watched so far. So I'm going to go and say seven days. I could see him being that out there. That insane. Seven weeks isn't even that long of a time, to be honest. Like, or sorry, it's, it's too long of a time even so, I think. But I'm going to say seven days. I do think it is seven days, but I'm going to go with seven weeks just to play the old game. I'm going to say weeks. I feel like to replace the film every seven days, like you're barely even getting it shown. I don't know that they'd even have a chance to edit it in seven days. I'm going to say seven weeks. Well, they didn't want them to edit it. Well, (laughs) fuck you, Cameron. You have the lead and I need to I need to work around here. So we're going weeks. I mean, I think weeks so, is a reasonable one, but we'll see. A fun fact about this one. Uh, after filming was done and the, the final cut was made of this movie, uh, Stanley Kubrick had one of his assistants burn all of the extra footage. So there are no deleted scenes. There is no extra anything of this movie. Uh, that being said, he did have all of the film reels that showed uh, A Clockwork Orange replaced every seven days. Nice. Wow. Which is insane. That's insane. Every that's single insane. week. Yeah. Damn. Like, oh, that's so much money. Kubrick's an intense guy, as we've learned. Like, he is know? insane. So He's Kubrick kept made, it insane. Uh, Stanley Kubrick <laughs> himself made the original cut of the movie. Like, nothing that was ever released, but his, his final cut of the movie was just over four hours long. Why? Why? Yeah, we had Why? this issue with Dr. Strangelove, too. Because he's a goddamn psychopath. That's why. He's a why. sadist. The dude just wants he to torture us. <laughs> he <laughs> doesn't know how to edit. Hey, Stan. <laughs> Stan, we're going to need you to cut like about two and a half hours of this movie. <laughs> no, We it's, literally it's all cannot important. show this in a theater, dude. Come on. Cut yeah, you. They, a break. They, uh, they couldn't get one. This is about four hours. Can you like cut some of it? We'll just, you know, save it for later on. You know, if we ever want to do like a new release or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. sounds good. I'm going to burn this motherfucker to the ground. <laughs> I'll show them two hours. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's funny. Nobody wanted the job to edit Kubrick's movie. So the studio ended up hiring a team of associate editors that collaboratively cut the movie together. So Kubrick wouldn't be arguing with just one person. It was a team of like five people he had to argue with. <laughs> he can't yell at one of us if we all suck. <laughs> God. Was he wildly successful before this movie? Like when was... When did he become like super popular? I mean, he he had uh, Doctor Strange Love came out before this. Two thousand one, A Space Odyssey came out before this. Mm, okay, Lolita was so. out. He had some big movies. Okay, so I guess it makes sense that they'd like put up with his Spartacus bullshit. Spartacus was out. Yeah, yeah, this was like. Uh, do you guys want the tiebreaker? I want to hear it. Yeah, let's hear. I it. like hearing it. All right, so there's a scene in the movie where Alex picks up two women uh, from a candy shop, like a record shop. After they leave the record store, uh, he takes them upstairs and they have this uh, sex scene that in the movie is sped up quite a bit. And it's that, that song is over like dun 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 How long did that sex scene take to film? Closest without going over. Oh, so long. Yeah. So fucking long. Especially because like because they it's m- like the women get up lapse. and get dressed and then get undressed repeatedly. Like like <laughs> like three times so wait, each woman so gets talking, up, gets dressed, and then they get undressed again. You're talking like including all of the takes, everything. Like no, every take. I'm saying I'm saying no, these, or just like, like how much the, was before it before it, it was up. sped up? Oh, yeah, I think yeah. I know the answer to this. I think I saw I think I saw something where Malcolm I think I saw something where Malcolm McDowell talked about this and how long it actually was. I gotta say at least like an hour. Yeah, I was gonna say 120 minutes. Oh, two hours. I think damn. it. I think it was like 27 or 28 minutes. Oh, maybe I'm way like off just this. under a, just under a half hour. It was 28 minutes. Wow, nice. Yeah, I saw something where Malcolm McDowell talked about that where when they shot it, he's like no. it was like a full. No, you did he didn't. not? No, you're just really good at being able to slow down, sped up sex scenes in your oh, mind and well, replay back it, the film. I watch it at point two five speed, so it was like normal for me. <laughs> Are you used to watching sex scenes at two point five speed? No, 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 no. It's I watch like them having at, sex with Ben. It's like thirty <laughs> seconds, and it's over. I watch him. Yeah, well, I have to watch him at like two point five speed, or else I don't get more than like ten seconds in. So we gotta. <laughs> I think you're saying you have to watch it at like. 
negative 2.5 like <laughs> like slow it down like slow it down yeah i have to slow it down negative oh, goes yeah. in reverse by the way <laughs> well, negative he watches them backwards, backwards. <laughs> ben watches them backwards it's the best way he watches uh ben watches porn the same way like kids in the 70s listen to led zeppelin records trying to summon the devil oh my god <laughs> trying to listen to it backwards to hear then demonic I get to watch sounds. the pizza guy leave you know and it concludes <laughs> it concludes the story in ben's in ben's fantasy world there's an entire profession of men that show up to a place and receive a pizza and then take it to a shop. <laughs> there's a uh, there's roles where people show up and f- and break your plumbing or break your cable. We never see them get to the shop though. It's really sad. It's very disappointing that we never <laughs> That's see the them. Ending he's looking for. It always ends leave. when they leave the house. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's the worst. We never know if the pizza makes it back. <laughs> Did he enjoy the pizza? I need to know. <laughs> Extra sausage. <laughs> Ma'am, right. I do my own plumbing. <laughs> Before the movie, those of us who had seen it, we wrote down our ratings based off memory and nostalgia. And now I want to know if our ratings have changed or not. But Cam's going to go first, and he's going to give us our his first impression rating. This one is challenging to rate because I I didn't really like the movie. Like, it was just, like, very hard to watch. And I don't think I didn't like it because it didn't have a point. Like, I understand themes of it. And I think kind of what you were supposed to take away from it a little bit. I mean, I when I was first watching it, I was like, I don't know if I get this movie. Um, but then after, you know, about the halfway point and, uh, you know, it kind of starts to unfold a little bit more, I think it makes more sense. Um, but man, just like some of the, like I've said, some of the scenes were just made it so hard to watch. The slang was kind of weird. I didn't, I don't know. I think I went in with like high expectations because of how well everybody like rates this movie is like, you know, really good movie. And then. You know, I, I've also, we've also seen The Shining, and so I watched it, and I didn't think it was going to be similar to that, but I was like, okay, I kind of know what a Kubrick film is going into it, and I don't know that I did. I don't know if I fully realized what I was getting myself into at this one. So it's hard to rate because I recognize that some people might like it or think it's, like, really good, even if I don't, but even so, I think I'm actually going to give it, like, a 5 out of 10. So, going into this movie, I had given it uh, a 6 out of 10. Um, I did remember some of the, you know, it being kind of a disturbing-y type of movie. Um, when I'd last seen it, I had I had just, quote-unquote, read the book. So, I, I, knew what I, was, I knew what I was going into. So, I remembered thinking, like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good movie. Uh, it wasn't anything that I was, like, super stoked about. It's nowhere near cracks like a top 10 list or anything for me. But after the rewatch, I dropped it down to like a four. At times, it just feels like it's violent for the sake of being violent. I get that there's the themes that you're supposed to pick up on it, but I feel like most of the people that like love this movie and really associate themselves with Alex are super edgy people and they're like oh he's such a great movie character and it's like no he's just a shitty person like he's a shitty person who in the end kind of gets his way which is not the moral lesson i feel like should be given through this movie i I, i've said it before i feel like you have to be in a headspace to watch this movie which is like in a mood where you just want to be sad watching a movie where you just want to be depressed by the time you get to the end of it so yeah uh season two i'm being subjective this movie's a four so i've seen this movie i think enough to where to where i get it i think i get it kubrick puts us in a world that shows all of the evil things and then proposes a solution that we can Ignoring free will, we can brainwash this guy who is a objectively bad person into making him do good things. But is that the right thing to do? 
does that make Alex a good guy now that he's been brainwashed? I think that is what the movie is saying. I think I get it. I still don't like it. It's a movie that does a good job telling that story, but it is not entertaining. I think you could tell that story, you know, you, you say in two words what it might take you to say in ten. I think Kubrick kind of has that problem in a lot of movies. This one, I think it's the most obvious. I think he goes way over the top to try to put you in this, he, he does too much world building in a world we don't care about, you know? He sets you up with, here's all the bad things, and then tries to propose, here's a fix-it solution. And then the question he's asking is, is that an actual solution or not? I've never really been fond of this movie. I went in giving it a four, and I'm going to leave it at a four. I'm not going to turn it on and watch it unless I'm doing a podcast or something. Uh, is it a movie I think everybody should see? Yeah, and that's why I didn't put it in the... Uh, the ranks of some legendary movies like Hubie Halloween or From Russia with Love. <laughs> but, I mean, if you ask me, like, hey, Zach, it's Sunday morning. You're hungover. You got pancakes. What are you going to watch? A Clockwork Orange or Hubie Halloween? I'm going to put on Hubie Halloween. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Something I, I didn't bring up, but I kind of wish I would have. We spent, like, the first hour and ten minutes of the movie with Alex being a shitty person. Like, he's only dealt with, like, the cure and, like, dealing with the fact that he's forced to be good for, like, 20 minutes before we just throw that out the window. Yeah, I mean, I guess that what makes it challenging is uh, the the movie's about the cure, right? Like, Alex is only really a, mech, a vehicle to tell the story about how the government is curing people by making them violently ill and taking away their free will. So, yes. like... That's what makes it tough. Is it's like which on one hand that would have, the focus is Alex, but but that could have been explored through like it's a two hour and fifteen minute movie. That movie could have been ex that or that theme could have been explored through more than forty minutes. Like we didn't have to spend the first hour of the movie explaining that Alex is a shitty person. We, yeah, you get that within the first five. We don't have to spend the next forty five yeah. minutes to an hour explaining that Alex is not a good person. We get it. You explain that pretty fast i will say knowing what i know about the movie i would at least once sit down and watch the four-hour version if it were handed to me to see like this is all kubrick he filmed it he made it he edited it this is what he wanted you to see maybe there's stuff that got that ended up on the cutting room floor i don't know but i would give the four-hour version a shot uh i will agree i think i said previously that this is like one flew of the cuckoo's nest and requiem where it's it's uncomfortable to watch it's not fun to watch but it is a really good movie like it's beautifully shot the music and the score just complements it in a sense but it it is difficult because it is ultra violent and horrible like sex sexual crime and stuff and it's it's really like disgusting to watch in a sense and it i think it makes a good commentary now as somebody in 2020 when you you know you tune into the news you turn it tune into whatever and it's all just violence and you have your violent video games and all this bullshit people try to pin like violent motivation towards um and it kind of does a good job of like kind of talking about that in a sense but i think it does kind of glorify it or at least people nowadays kind of turn it in that sense and they're like oh alex and the droogs they're they're people to to dress up as on halloween and and i have my a poster of them in my college dorm you know that sort of shit like others have said it's good but it's not i don't think it's deserves its spot where it is at i think it's what 103 or something on imdb yeah one yeah it's like four spots ahead of taxi driver oh yeah i think it's <laughs> the definitely... other glorified I think this movie gets the Kubrick bump, and that's why people give it so much. If it were any other director's name on it, it wouldn't be there. Oh, imagine if Christopher Nolan did a Clockwork Orange. Oh, All those explosions. Oh. But I I think it's good, and for that reason, I'll give it a 6.5 out of 10. But I think it's a you watch it once, and then you you probably don't really need to watch it again or you probably won't want to 
because it is just a depressing watch like i i got no like redeeming or enjoyment from watching the film other than like hey this looks really cool this looks nice like that's it if you enjoy this don't forget to rate and subscribe and check us out on instagram at cocktails and classics pod use the hashtag cocktails and classics to send us your movie and drink recommendations uh share us with your friends and family drop a rating on apple follow and subscribe if you're on spotify apple google wherever helps us out and you get to stay up to date uh grab some straws grab that audible trial and uh, as always watch responsibly <laughs>